greetings everyone welcome to the 148th session of the online optom learning series and for today's session we have with us a very uh, special academician i would say uh, professor monica choudhry uh, she actually you know to be very honest she doesn't need any introduction but uh, to the attendees uh, who are joining us from far and apart Professor Monica Chaudhary is an optometrist with more than over three decades of experience in clinical as well as in academics. Uh, she is now a retired optometrist and educator from the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. She headed the optometry school in MIT University, and her last role was as the director, School of Health Science, Ansel University. Uh, she has authored several books uh, i think two of the main important books which is the contact lens primer and you know the basics of low vision which were very very important for me as a student as well when we were sitting for my final uh, internship viva <laughs> with uh, with those books she has also have experience in publishing papers in peer reviewed journals she has also chaired scientific sessions as and you know has been advisor and key opinion leader to many i care industry partners more recently she has moved out to be a freelancer educationalist strategy advisor and also practicing with extraordinary skills in optometry education and is also the founder of an online optometry upskilling education platform which is known as learn beyond vision she has also instituted some centers of excellence and vision centers which aims to be the unique referral academic as well as research units her name is very well known as a contact lens as well as a low vision specialist and you know she ref she gets patient referrals from across uh, india as well as abroad she also has been awarded the global educator of the year by iacal the australasian leadership fellowship award and has the shri shri title awarded for her achievements and with uh, that 3 years decade of experience she still continues to see patients uh, you know some days in a week she is going to talk to us about uh, what are the advances in low vision aids and low vision devices and share her expertise with us so welcome uh, for some monica choudhury on top platform and let me leave the screen time to you thank you so much rakhrudin in fact the introduction and certainly the books are now getting outdated because i would like to say that yes things are evolving so fast that the literature and the books cannot update thanks to covid online education has become a reality and uh, Uh, we all are uh, able to proceed and learn from each other third i would say my patients have been always my teachers and wonderful education that you are conducting i think you have been an inspiration for us to run this and to all the fellows before we move on i would like to say ols and found a learn beyond vision are partners now and because our objective and mission is same so hence we all aspire to help each other um educate uh, from each one's experience so now running over to the topic and thank you for setting that ball rolling okay so the first thing i wanted to ask one and everybody is do we really understand our patients what does visual disability mean to him until we have experienced that some part of it ourselves will not be able to manage our patients and you know who taught me all this while we were running the courses we had our patients who came into these platforms and became some of the teachers for us as practitioners so you need to understand your patients very well before you move on and one of the exercise that i would request each one of you to do is simulate yourself blur your vision by putting those few plus lenses or things like that make yourself 
into that situation, get over it, and then you will realize what is what your patient is going through and what should be done and how you can help them out. So overall, low vision means three things for us. Yes, that is one thing that we all as practitioners do. We are enhancing the residual vision. So there has to be some residual vision in this patient's eye. And we would magnify by using certain devices. And by magnification, we make it practical for him to start using it. And last part, low vision completes only if we work on rehabilitation simultaneously. Now, you know, most of the time, what, what, what most simplest format I could tell you is your patient has a particular vision. Let's say he has a vision uh, graded to near vision. Let's say the terms is the patient can see the vision N36 size. You would use the devices so that you could make the N6 become N36. So you would magnify the N6 to a size of N36. And hence, what will happen? The patient will start seeing it. This is all what we have been taught doing magnification formulas, calculations, even those kind of things is what we have been doing so far. But any low vision compensation doesn't end up until all of us are well aware of the rehabilitation process. And this is something I realized not everybody is completing it. So while my section uh, lecture today itself is trying to make you understand, understand the needs. The first important thing is we all are used to these visual equity charts. We are used to eye examination in a clinic. We only think about 66, 612, 69. For us, it makes a difference. And especially the young ones or the freshers, where you've always been taught to do six by six vision when you are doing the refraction, you miss on very important things. For a low vision patient, this 666, 36 is not what is should be considered. There is not only the quantity of vision which we have to assess, there is a quality of vision which a low vision patient is suffering from. Now, a picture here, of course, which tells you how the glare, now the same amount of vision the patient may have, but look at what glare does to his vision. Whatever residual he has, the quality is going on. Same thing in these two pictures, which were picked up from the internet again. You can see here the contrast being good and the contrast being bad. So the same quantity of vision, if I would have asked the patient to read the alphabet A or the alphabet B, the patient would have read on the, um, on the visual equity charts, especially. But the world is not black and white as we see on the visual equity chart. It is different shades of grays. Now, all of you would just look into a, a, a small experiment you do for yourself. We assume all of us are six by six and do not have glare equities or quality problems in contrast. Just reduce the contrast of your phone screen and make it more bright. What will happen to the six by six person's quality also? You need to simulate this to understand that every low vision patient is just not talking about quality of vision. It is the uh, quantity of vision. It is the quality of vision which matters also. Now, besides this, what we don't understand in our patient, our patients rarely come across a field of vision where they can see everything in totality without any field defect. Very rare. Most of the patients who come to us with disorders, I mean, you can list them, macular degeneration, ARMDs and others. This is a, an example of central field loss. The patient's central field loss. Now, if I would have asked this patient to record vision, I would have got a, even a 6-9 parts or a 6-12 visual equity because he can tilt out and his peripheral vision could give us that. Now, does this patient see as good as 6 by 12? So this is what is happening to a central field loss patient. Don't go by quality, uh, quantity, think about quality. And on top of it, think about the field effect. 
Now, this is a particular simulated picture that I tried to click with a patient with this various scattered scotomas, you know. So you can peep in from here and there to give you an alphabet. And the last picture here talks about retinitis pigmentosa, 5 degree, 10 degree, or those tubular field patients. Now, this tubular field patient, if, if it was a picture which was taken, would have read 6 by 6 on the visual equity chart. But this is what do we understand? So the whole concept is trying to make you understand, understand your patient, and then only you'll be able to solve the problem. Now, the central field patient loss patient and a peripheral field loss patient have contrasting issues. When it is a tubular field and it's a, a peripheral field loss, the patient is just seeing and scanning and, you know, he is going to be having mobility problem. He doesn't see anything on the sides. He can see straight. So when you ask him to look straight, he can say, yes, I can see your face. I can read there. But what happens on the side, he doesn't know. So the major problem this patient is going to have is orientation mobility issues. So he's going to bump in the objects. The second one, when it comes to a central field loss, he'll communicate to you that I can't see faces. And, then, and he'll be tilting like, now I can. Now, when I look straight at the television, I can't see faces. So day-to-day -day activities are very difficult when it is a peripheral field loss. And when it comes to central field loss, the difficulties are more onto the near task because macula is needed for the center to see near. Wherever he focuses, everything goes into a, that dark circle. And it's very frustrating. Now, another thing is, when we talk about low vision and workups, and if you have those standard protocols of case sheets, it doesn't fit into everybody's life. I would like you to just think about a child from a rural area who comes to you with visual impairment or a child who is just a student. What's his life to make him independent? For him, it's the book, reading and education. Suppose there is another person who is moving around a conductor or something, what's his life? His life is mobility, traveling, daily living, you know, a labor or those kind of things. So students and life is now not typically, I'll tell you more than three decades because I really don't want to mention it's almost touching the fourth decade about my career because then people guess my age. But when we used to give press biopic corrections, I'm talking of early 80s. The, the, the question we used to ask this housewife is, Sui mein dhaga dalta hai. for those of you who understand Hindi, can you needle the thread? Was the question we used to ask. And if not, means press biopic correction. Or if I look at my mother, of course, she was educated and a teacher. But what was her reading class requirement? Her requirement was only when she was checking in the books. So the whole story or scenario has changed everywhere now. The world is different. The world is now all digitalized and virtual. Each one of your low vision patients, believe it or not, is going to, the needs are online. And the compute, the, the mobile phones are become a part of our life. Next 15 minutes, if I'm not with my mobile phone or attending it, I think my life is are finished or if I leave it or lose it. So the whole need, what are we talking to our patients? Are we talking to our patients with these hand magnifiers and a mobile phone? Or are we talking about stand magnifiers or dome magnifiers? I still remember my maid son, who's just four years old, is attending digital online classes, especially these last two years of the COVID. So does, he, does his need get solved if suppose there is a visual impairment, can we solve our visually impaired people problems with the new world that has come in? I think the whole things or scenarios are changing. We need to understand our patients. And when we talk to understand our patient, we need to understand his independence. So the independence is most of the time talking about traveling, self-care. Can you imagine applying a makeup? And that I had a very high profile low vision patient. For her, it was, I do attend gatherings with my husband. He was a very high profile person. She's 70 years old, but she still says, 
I need a device for my makeups because I can't ask my maid to put on a lipstick on myself. Reading, finding food in the kitchen, and even when the food is on the table, eating, recreation, television, even a more, you know, all these are part of light, life and it's not the vision screen. So when you are going to assess your low vision patient, you need to understand him in totality. What's his life? And you may imagine your own life. Your own life may not be the same as my own life. My needs may be different. But in, a, in routine, let me just run through these quick things. What do we do? We have a very simple way of doing a sequence of exams. And I do not deny it. It still follows the same pattern. We start with a very important thing is, of course, the treatment is done. Please do not begin with a slit lamp or an anterior segment eye examination. You All you need is a good history papers that the patient is carrying with him. Then next what? This is all that you need to work on your patient. History, taking, seeing the reports, and then quickly moving on, asking him questions about his personal life. Now, a patient sitting right in front of you, how can you start talking to you? How do you do? How do you dress up? How do you groom? How do you move about? There have to be good communication skills, and that keeps going while you are examining. You have to enter into the personal space of communication with this patient while you are examining, and you have to totally extract out what does this visually impaired person needs. So I would begin with the examination, of course, my visual equity and logma charts. It's very surprising. Not many clinics still have a logma chart. We are used to the Snellens and I like it. But, you know, that gives me my mind is tuned up to that 624, 636. But logma is what you need when you really need to work up a low vision patient. You may not just do six by 60 and stop there. You need to bring it closer. You need at one meter, two meters. And look at the thrill this patient is going to have when you're going to do at that two meter, three meter, because first time they could start reading those few alphabets, which they never, or they guess the top alphabet. Then, as I have explained you in my initial slides, this is what needs to be thoroughly done by each one of you. Confrontation, visual field testing. You have to be very good with this. You need to understand it's tubular. It, there are techniques to do it. And yes, it will go beyond the scope of my presentation if I keep talking about it. Then call contrast testing. And once you have had the assessment of quality, quantity, move on to the trials of devices then only. And let me just talk about what were we had so far for our distance devices. We had just the, sorry, the telescopes, few contrast enhancing filters and glare cutters, which are those. Um, and I don't know how many of you are actually having access to these kind of devices. And for the near, you have a plethora of these magnifiers, spectacle magnifier, hand magnifier, stand magnifier, even near telescopes and different types and shapes of these devices, which you can categorize them into either of these three. So far the management, so we do the quantity. We would just prescribe, okay, son, you need this for distance. You need, uh, I, the patient obviously would say, I can't see far off. A telescope, done. When I talk about near, a hand magnifier, a spectacle magnifier, or a stand magnifier, done. Then we supplement with non-optical devices that what we have been taught about. We've been told about contrast enhancers. We've been taught about those reading guides, writing guides, signature guides, a table lamp for illumination and things like that. Okay, that stands and these are part of the life. So for managing visual patients, we need three things to understand before we move on to our patient. One is, yes, we will have the device and we'll talk about what's evolved in these devices. The second most important thing is talking about psychology of your patient. A fresh visually impaired person who has lived, let me say an RP patient, who's enjoyed full-fledged vision throughout his life, 
or an ARMD patient who is now 60, 70 years, suddenly macular degeneration setting in all the series of those treatments and nothing to do after that. They are mentally disturbed. They are in a denial mode. The denial mode goes on to the anger mode. God, why me? And then it goes into a closed domain of, you know, not accepting anything. So if your patient is in this psychology where he is in a denial mode or in an aggressive mode or is not ready to accept his visual impairment, please believe me, whatever device you will suggest, he'll say, no, I don't like it. There'll be fault in it like a cosmetic fault. There'll be some other reason which the patient will keep coming out with. So the thoughts are that why are we picking up our patients who are not going to accept? And typically when we did surveys for our low vision patients, you know, the practitioners come back with an answer. Patients don't accept it. It is too expensive for that patient. He is not ready. You know, it is not so appealing. The vision could improve only from 618, 660 to 636. Mind you, 660 to 636 is a big difference for a visually impaired, provided he accepts that. And the last part, we never talk about rehabilitation to our patients. Rehabilitation means in your clinic, you have just done the device, but he's not just come here to take the device and read a newspaper. His life has to be managed in terms of employability, his independence, his social independence, his other kind of encouragements which have to come in from you you know so those are the factors which you have to understand so let me now come up what is evolved over the time one such is by optic telescope some of you may have known it uh, i had started dealing with it in, since 2012 since i was more in academics my commercial practice was less and i'm back again into some of it but Bioptic telescope was pretty expensive in 2012, but the economic state of the patients have evolved and I love this product. This telescope is so sleek as you can see and you can see one of our senior friend Yashwant wearing it and this is Dr. Henry Green, who is the founder of this. So this is such a sleek kind of, you know, look at this. It's a sleek telescope which fits over the spectacle. Patient needs to just alternate, see and come back. It is recommended for driving also in US if the vision improves beyond 6 by 12. So our cosmetic advantage, these are the telescopes so far that we've been telling the conventional ones that we've been telling our patients. Do we still intend to give those conventional telescopes when we have the modern ones where cosmetic appearance, quality and things can be much better? I would like to add here again, and in the last, I will talk to you and address to your question about expenses. And I love to express that again, which I will not release now, but I will discuss it in the last. So talking about Occutech, if you are interested more to learn, OLS and we are partners. So 19th October, live telecast of the Dr. Henry Green, who's going to come in, we are only taking up a few registered people. He'll be teaching you all about Occutec devices and how they are different, which are the various models. Even the fitting of these telescopes will be taught. Going back again to these optical devices, I don't say stop prescribing them. You have to. There are certain advantages. Uh, a quick prescription to be read, a very cheap, small, few hundred rupees, hand magnifiers work beautifully, stand magnifiers, dome magnifiers. This is part of the journey. You shouldn't limit yourself to one device. Ma the dome magnifier may work for reading on the book at the table, a hand for a quick magnifier like this. So a patient should have access to all these devices and just not a single device. But what has come in next, I know some of you would have seen, these are these portable video magnifiers. It's just like a phone call, you know, where you're giving these video magnifiers and mind you, your phones also become some of them. The Zoomax handheld video magnifier M5 HD Plus.
The M5 HD Plus is the up-to-date, 5-inch high-definition handheld video magnifier, featuring a compact design and great functions such as distance viewing, image storage, adjustable reading line and masks, and easy panning. A complimentary handle included in the package offers different holding angles to allow users to have an added reading experience. In addition, the M5 HD Plus could also connect to a TV or monitor through an HDMI to increase the overall magnification. Now let's start the basic operations of the M5 HD Plus. Press and hold the power button for 3 seconds to turn it on. With the 5 megapixels HD cameras and the unique 1280 by 720 pixel screen resolution display, the M5 HD Plus provides you with an incredible crystal clear image suitable for any age group. Press the zoom in button to zoom in and press the zoom out button to zoom out. You can change the magnification from 2.3 times to 16 times continuously or level by level. By pressing the mode button, you can circle around full color and 10 high contrast color modes. To enter favorite color mode, first choose your favorite contrast color. Then press and hold the mode button for 3 seconds until you hear a beep. The favorite color, color mode will simplify your choices with three color modes. Full color, the chosen color, and its reversed color mode. Easily exit the favorite color mode the same way. To freeze a real-time image, short press the white freeze button on the top right corner of the device. When the image has been zoomed in, Press the four intuitive panning buttons on the left side to view detailed areas of the photo. You can also use one finger to press on the touch screen and pan to view details in any direction. Now let's experience the advanced operations. When an image is frozen, press the freeze button and zoom in button simultaneously for three seconds to save the image. A tick icon will appear on the screen indicating the photo has been saved. The M5 HD Plus can store up to 60 photos. To prime viewing mode after the photo operation. To activate the reading line and masks, short press the zoom in and zoom out buttons simultaneously. Under the real time viewing mode, you can circulate through horizontal and vertical reading lines and horizontal and vertical reading masks. Press the up or down button to move the horizontal reading line to your desired position. Press the left or right button to move the vertical reading line to the desired position. To adjust the width of the horizontal reading mask, press the up or down button. To adjust the width of the vertical reading mask, press the left or right button to your desired width. Long press the zoom in button and zoom out button at the same time for three seconds to enter into menu mode. Okay, so I would just pause here. So in fact, one thing, there is no commercial interest in showing you that product. But the reason why I have shown you that product was because the video was very extensive and they shared the permission for us to be uh, telecast in this lecture. So uh, it's one of the favorite products also, I would say, because it has a lot of features. Now, you would get many brands who are selling this. There are also local brands and Make in China's and other product brands. So the price varies. However, the features would vary in each one of them. So this is one of the video of our, uh, uh, you know, a clinic. Academy when I, we were teaching, you know, the patients been demonstrated and trained on these kind of devices to learn and how the modes beautifully fit in. So you saw the magnification can go from anything between 1x to 16x. So now the whole book chapters that we taught about calculation of magnification, you don't need. Patient can modify and come back to the magnification he needs. It goes as a very sleek model like a phone and can be used into it. 
So next, I want to just tell you that there are so many technologies in this world which have evolved over it. There are certain devices like this particular one device is a child who's sitting in a classroom. There is a camera which takes the blackboard and projects it onto the laptop. You know, so there are so many devices, depending upon the particular need of the patient, you can pick and choose these devices from the various catalogs that you have. But most important now is the whole world has changed into text to speech synthesizer. And this is what has evolved today. I think all of us, even I love when I'm not with my press biopic correction, if I have to type a message, I would just speak up. And my phone would record or even the messages can be record my emails. Although you use those word files and things, you can just speak out and it types. Now, a visually impaired person is going to utilize this text to speech and speech to text concept and everything changes in his life. There are so many free apps, software, applications inbuilt applications to even your Microsoft, Google Chromes, everything, you know, where your visually impaired need to be helped. All you need to do is you are not here to teach them this. Text to speech, speech to text, there are rehabilitation centers which are now training, but you need to divert. Now, the patient sitting next to you is going to only going to ask you, I can't see the online classes or my lectures. So for the visual uh, virtual world, the world is now going to use, utilize these applications. And there are beautiful products like OrCam, iSight and others, which are even based on virtual reality, augmented reality. And I'll be talking more about it. The next is our smartphone is a low vision device also. One of the pictures picked up like this patient wanted to read the menu click the picture on the phone and you magnify. I'm not going to share those informations, but it is for you all. If you are excited about the lecture today, Google search, you'll find so many apps, free downloadable apps for visually impaired, which work better than these optical devices. They're like magnifying apps. There are text to speech converting apps and you don't need to invest in any of them. So the whole world can be actually, and, and who taught me first was my patients only. So they were, these were the patients who were young, smart ones, and they came over every time to tell me, ma'am, did you see this um, uh, kind of uh, device? Did you see this app? Did you see this app? And there are many more apps which are being developed and who are doing it? The visually impaired people are themselves doing it because they are trying to come up with solutions. And one such invitation is to a person who is developing one app, he's visually impaired himself. He'll also demonstrate some to you. So a list of these are available. Zoom view, magnifying softwares, big shots. I mean, you name it. Many of them are subsidized by the governments also. Think look around google search understand these so the whole story is i don't need devices i need a smartphone i need these softwares and yes of course for my mobility and other things we need to do one more thing the most important thing which you all miss out is enhance the contrast how many of you would have prescribed filters to your low vision patients look at it it is here that's the difference which it makes to its life. The whole vision becomes, you are not enhancing quantity, but you are enhancing the quality. Cut down the glare in case of patients with problems with glare and the quality improves. The same 6 by 60 or same 6 by 36 is a beautiful 6 by 36, which is overexcited about. Prosthetic lenses, center clear are very good for albinisms and aniridia. Try them. It works because it enhances and cuts their glare. So next last part I will be talking about so far, what did we have for our peripheral field? Sorry for that spelling loss patients. We only had that reverse telescope and this I'm talking about 80s and 90s, that doorbell kind of thing never worked. My prescription only went to one patient in my lifetime. And yes, I had learned about these Fresnel prisms also, 
for hemianopic patients. We had a very limited number of patients whom we can help. The contrast goes down in hemianopic patients also if he's had multiple problems. And yes, the diffraction itself causes a problem. So now I'm going to show you some devices which is developed by Oxide. Oxide is, stands for a uh, spin out for, um, from Oxford University, UK, and they have developed many electronic glasses as an innovation. And this is the picture of it. And in fact, this is the old picture. They have revised the uh, version of it to a further one, which I don't have access to that device. So as part of the trials when we were doing, so this was the prototype here. And I was part of those team where we did some trials on these augmented realities and virtual reality classes. And we did it. I want to show you a certain video about um, the next one. That was for peripheral field loss patients. And this is for central field loss, which we have launched this year in UK. And um, the results are amazing. And I would like to talk to you about some more things. So video because it simulates how a central patient can look at. I can see a jumper, but I can't see a face. Mm -hmm. I couldn't tell you. Mm -hmm. It's in the normal position, he can't see anything. You see some lines. Um, that's about it. Well, I can see you okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. I feel much closer to him, I must admit. Mm -hmm. I can see his teeth, his tongue, his nose, his eyes, his eyebrows, his ears. And then can I have a bit of the Yeah, I can't Ah, I can't Oh, he, he says, he can see the eyes, the nose, the mouth. But he can see the face. Oh, he can know the expressions now. Oh, that's better. I think he might be crying. He is upset, yeah. They are much clearer. His eyes are still obviously squinty and closed. Lots of lines on the face and on the neck. Yeah. Um, mouth open. Oh, I can see um, sort of facial hair now as well. And definitely for blue t-shirt. Yeah. I can see teeth showing. Mind you, the last time I saw her, she was only a baby. <laughs> you know why I showed you this uh, before I move on to another expression video, which was on the prototype when we were doing. I didn't know it myself. We've always been tuned with our brains to understand visual equity. For us, ma'am, it is improving from one visual equity, not much only 660, doesn't improve much, only 624. And we ourselves lose art on giving the devices. But what, why I picked up this particular video to show you is, you know, even seeing the face, the features, the hair on the face, the color of the t-shirt makes difference to the visually impaired. We never understood those needs. For a patient, it means a lot. You know, one of the patients when I we were doing trials and we were standing in the balcony and it's like, what a poor corp vision. He took me out to the balcony and I said, you like the device? What do you like? Your vision's hardly improving. He says, can you stand in this balcony? He took me out. He says, Monica, do you see that tree there in that? He's, he's almost, I said, yes, there is a tree in front of it. You see the green color? I said, yes, I see the green color. He put on the device and he says, for me, that green color itself has a meaning. I do not see the finer part of the tree, 
but he cried to say i can see the green color of that leaves so this is my message which i wanted to convey today that seeing small things make a big difference to patient's life which we as normal individuals have not understood i would like to continue some part of the video before i switch on this is for a peripheral field loss patient and you will see some simulation which they have because they had a connection with this camera so that they can also a person while we did trials we could see what the patient is seeing through so these are all tubular field 5 degree at night is what i could see 20 30 years ago well i never imagined that i'd be able to see that again what this group black and how much can you see of me now i can see the beginnings of your shoulders but i can't see the rest of your body but i can see the camera guys over there Boards that they can change to see. Not aware of it. Body. Also helps in reading text. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Got it. So that's quite nice. Wow. Yeah, that's why. <laughs> wow, that 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 is really impressive. It is actually quite amazing to get uh, so much more detail on their face. Without my glasses, I'm looking at kind of pink blobs, really. Um, I've just zoomed backwards. Now that's much, much better. I'm wondering whether it's the sort of thing I could wear walking into the cinema. It sounds silly to think that you know a, a registered blind person would even attempt going to a cinema. Can you see more now in in this color mode than you can normally? No. Oh, definitely. I, I just love it. It's amazing to be here today and see what I saw years ago is just life changing. Okay, you know, um, so this was all about my presentation. I wanted to sensitize you all to understand the needs of the patient, and if you will understand. the world has evolved for this patient do not just stick into your clinic rooms and if any one of you is interesting before i stop sharing my screen there's a small course six weeks course where we do on this and uh, last i would like to say yes if you are an ols member there is a special uh, group that has been created and you can approach us through this ols as we are partners So that's all from our end. Again, a message: you can make a difference to your patient's life. Do not leave your visually impaired patient by just saying nothing to do, and let them not be helped out. Believe me, we have case stories where patients have shared with us to say that yes, we were totally not connected or helped because simply the optometrist do not find. that um, there is uh, opportunity in it there is business in it i feel that low vision can build up relations for you with your patients please have that passion to deal with your patients talk to them and you'll enjoy it in okay. fact i am more of a contact lens specialist which was my first love but i ultimately realized that what gave me the satisfaction was even the low vision practice Thank, thank you. you thank you monica ma'am i think uh, it was a very comprehensive one i think some of the devices and the ideas uh, which you shared I, i i would say the ideas which you shared uh, you know were something which really needs to be looked on and that would be very useful as a clinical tip for all clinicians who are listening today right then the first question here is uh, any idea about the optical concept behind the oxide glasses so it's it's actually virtual and augmented reality you know so it's a tv screen in it there is no optics in it there is a tv screen rather in it okay. so it picks up all the image and it flashes on it so the world of this patient is going to be in that goggles so i don't know if you have all seen google lens augmented realities and these you know so the low vision devices which are coming up in the market 
uh, A site and others, the Geordies, the Geordies very bulky, the A site is there. This one was very sleek and they're more natural looking, you know. So what it does, it, it has cameras, it has television, it converts the impulse. It is based on the depth perception. You know, the far the object, the pixelation it will pick and it will create that image in it. So ask me in truth, it's a lot of physics in it. It's a lot of uh, new kind of uh, visual concepts, but it is not an optical device. Not and I do understand, ma'am, you were a part of uh, this particular device uh, during trials. the inception trials. and trials. I, yeah. Yeah. I will, I'm the clinical advisor okay. uh, when it was, uh, we were doing trials in India. All right. Great. So, you know, it's, it's been tested by uh, ma'am. So we can definitely vouch for it, I would say. Great. In fact, the most advanced version was to reach, has just reached me last month. Because okay. uh, of COVID, they were and there were production disruptions also. Okay. And uh, they have a waiting list of people buying this device um, up till February next year. So they are expediting more productions. Okay. And the cost is globally the same. Okay. It doesn't mean that in pounds it's going to be more or in rupees it's going to be less. It's all over the same right now. And uh, they're trying to further reduce the manufacturing cost so that they can cut down the price. Thank you. Okay. And uh, should somebody has just uh, messaged me here, can they directly contact Oxide or is there a special channel through which they, they can, can even go through? go through the website? Okay. All right. So if you are interested, I think you can directly approach. Uh, you can see a lot of information is there on the website. Website as well. Of course, in the my concept in this video um, lecture today was to introduce about yeah. them to you. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, one more question here is: uh, Do you think the role of an optometrist in terms of collaborating with mental health professionals during low vision rehabilitation is important? And maybe you can add on how could we, uh, you know, go ahead? What should be the steps? So. Um, Yes, I, as I said in our course, we rather teach the whole psychology part of it uh, and we also teach rehabilitation. 60 per, uh, 40% of our uh, course is rehabilitation. Now, we don't, as optometrists, we don't intend to be doing it, but we should know where to send. So the moment I identify my patient, which is a simple questionnaire-based identification, that this patient is mentally first needs to be supported the clinic must have a psychologist linked up or you could have these psychotherapies done we even spoke about uh, you know in india of course we developed a whole evolving system there is just a helpline number which you need to send to this patient and these guys will take care of it they'll take care of diverting you to the counselors and things and you know, one of the best examples in our first cohort that came up was the counselor, if there are good tertiary or secondary level eye clinics, I don't see individuals, individuals will have to have a referral pattern, but tertiary centers or secondary level eye hospitals should invest in hiring a counselor and this counselor should be visually impaired. One, you are doing a good job by, by giving employment. Second, this counselor itself talks about counseling to the patient as term of acceptance of the disorder. Then there are beautiful networks which are there globally even. You can even connect to somebody in Australia through the site, their websites there. And you can connect the patients to link up. They have helpline numbers there too. Next, let me talk about low vision rehabilitation. India has a network. India has an NAB center. There are NGOs and sites which are working beautifully. But if you don't tell your patient, you see, the patient will ask for everything. Patient says, I can't walk. Now, your device, you can give a telescope, but you can't train on walking. You need to divert them to a rehab center. It is the integral part. I would say you can have your brochures or at least a phone number 
or their brochures in your clinic, which is your local area rehab center, please divert your patients to them. Then only you are providing the real care of making them independent. So psychology, rehab and devices, these three things make it together as a low vision service to the patient. And I think, ma'am, as you were saying that, you know, India has uh, a low vision rehab uh, connection. I think most of the countries at least have the associate, the, yes. the blind associations. As, yes. right? very, very much. And it's only, you know, unfortunate we may Google around to read and learn many more things. But we forget that we have so much that we can offer to our visually impaired person. All you need to do is divert them to a right rehab center and they'll take good care of it. That's right. Yeah. So, you know, those people who are not from India, you can reach out to the uh, National Blind Associations and, you know, they could be of a real great help in getting you the connection. And then you as an individual or a tertiary eye care center, you can coordinate with them and it takes things ahead for your patient. And are there any other optical devices which are useful for driving? The bioptics, of course, yes, is something which is allowed. In uh, US, not in all. In the US country. only. Yeah. 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 Uh, but you see, there is a particular limit to the driving. Uh, I've Unfortunately, I have even had patients with 4 by 60 vision and they claim they drive. However, I joked to say that, please don't, do let me know. I don't want to be on the same lane where you drive. But there are some clues by which they pick up or whatever. But there are, for my knowledge, only bioptic telescope is the one where, you know, patient has to have 6 by 12 vision. And there has to be a certain grading of vision, quality, quantity, contrast, everything measured. And then it is like the patient drives, but suddenly he sees a, uh, a signboard which he can't read. So he can alternate with that bioptic telescope, read and then move ahead. Now, this is US. The traffic in US is very, very disciplined. I cannot claim this device would ever be permitted in our country like India, where there are no rules and regulations with the fully sighted ones also. So um, that's what I know of. Uh, but you can even add contrast enhancing filters, glare cutting devices. But of course, the quantity of vision is very important for our patients. That's right. And would you want to share more about the vision rehabilitation and restoration program or some clinical tips which you want to, you know, let us? I know it's a very big chunk, as you say, the 40%. I know, I know talking cost. about rehabilitation is totally talking about everything. Okay. So to Zubair, I would just end up uh, saying uh, it is realistic. In fact, um, I have connections now with my helpline numbers. They are simple helpline numbers. And one of the beautiful things I started doing before we had did not have these. We, as uh, Fakhruddin had said, that we have NAB centers. So NAB, National Association Blind Centers, is one which you would send. Not only that, pride. There are certain patients who have already rehabilitated themselves. Just give the phone number of this patient to the other patient. They are big counselors. They're big motivators. And that what has worked for me in many cases. I have just passed on a WhatsApp contact number of the other patient and said, Ye, this is the one who's using these devices, who's using, who's trained on computers, can work in his office. And those patients have diverted them to the right channels. Now, it is important because, you know, India is too big. Cities and states, patient cannot be said sitting in Delhi that he can, there is something in Mumbai or something. Another important thing now is with technologies advancing, with the remote learning advancing, the trainings have started happening online for visually impaired people also to pick up. There are courses which are six weeks, four weeks, in-house courses like Vision Aid Center in India is doing a beautiful job of using these assistive technologies. They are training their patients onto it. So, so there is no doubt it is realistic. It has to be part of it. 
and um, my i it makes my job easy i would give the telescope the device the magnifier and the very next moment to every person i connect to a vision rehab center it has to be a part of your low vision practice yeah i think thank you so much ma'am i think that's really important and i think one key message or very important point is you know try to connect your patients with the other patients who are already using the device and already has been through that learning phase of acceptance you know the psychology what you are talking denial acceptance and all of that so they are already ready and they could be very good counselors i personally have experienced that as well with couple of patients you know when you refer or when you create that community uh, they talk very well and somebody else's problems uh, you know somebody else might have already faced and came up with their own ideas on how to overcome it so when they talk it's much more easy right right so uh, with that i think we thank you very much uh, monica ma'am for this wonderful uh, eye opener presentation and letting us know what's the advancement of low vision and uh, thank you so much for answering all the questions as well thank you my pleasure wonderful so, evening spend and i think uh, it's been an audience uh, you're doing a wonderful job i would say uh, wonderful teaching learning i mean who would sit and spend even you spending not one hour but many hours just to bring in people to teach i um, acknowledge your passion and i congratulate you for this wonderful platform that you run through thank you thank you most welcome ma'am it's it's just the whole team who is behind uh, the success i would say and all the attendees taking part and speakers uh, experienced people like you who coming up and sharing uh, you know your time with us i would say so to the attendees uh, just uh, a couple of announcements before we end for today uh, we do have an e symposium planned and i have been talking about this for the past one and a half two months we have been planning this and the day is finally going to arrive it's in the next four days on the world side day or 2021 on thursday so i extend my invitation to you if you have not registered yet uh, we are sharing the link to registration and you can join us for a full pack four hours of e uh, e learning uh, e symposium which revolves around primary eye care one just yeah just be reminded there are certain contests as well and you can uh, win exciting prizes so we have four contests uh, you can either capture or create a video by you know the main agenda of having the video is uh, eye care awareness or vision awareness and you can send that video to participate in the contest we also have an ocular photography contest whereby you can submit your uh, wonderful ocular structure images which you have captured you can also take part by solving the crossword uh you know there is a crossword related to basic optometry terms and uh, definitions and you can run for sight this is a very interesting one we want to achieve some uh, number of kilometers which we all optometrists and eye care professionals can run or walk together we are not disclosing the number yet but we will disclose it on the final uh, day and you can also win some exciting prizes for all the four contests so the last date is uh, 12th of october which is two days from now so you have two more days uh, to plan up and submit your entry we do have session planned next weekend so do join us uh, on the 14th on the world side day and then uh, next would be on the next sunday on the 17th for our regular ols sessions until then take care be safe and i will see you uh, on the 14th and on the 17th as well take care everyone and be safe bye bye thank you thank you everybody thank you monica ma'am bye